welcome to have you swallowed the hook, a 21st century challenge to the 19th century worldview of Darwinian evolution. My name is Thomas Bentley, and I'll be your host for this six-part series on origins. And when you talk about origins, really there are two basic types that we have in our world today. There is creation model and the evolutionist model. One based upon theism, the other atheism. One based upon purpose that we see in our world, the other based upon accident. One based upon design, and the other based upon random chance and necessity. But it's interesting, friends, that where we're going to pivot this discussion on origin is going to happen in the decade of the 1980s. The decade of the 1980s was really an amazing time for science as scientists in earth science and also in genetics and other fields were beginning to realize that Darwinian evolution really doesn't seem like it was much of a player. In fact, if evolution were a boxer, in the 1980s it had taken so many hits that it was out. It was down on the ground and they were counting one, two, and then all of a sudden the government of the United States gives evolution a bailout. Not by the science, friends, but by the decision of unelected judges. Let me explain what happened. The case was a Gillard versus Edwards in the Supreme Court of the United States. And this case was about a Louisiana law called the Balanced Treatment for Creation Science and Evolution Science Act. And what had happened was, in this particular uh, state, they had brought to the legislature, it went into law in 1983, and then atheist groups began challenging that law, and it made it to the Supreme Court in 1987. There, the atheist, the lawyers for the atheists challenged this law, not based upon the science, not based upon the, the wrongness of creation science, but simply based upon the fact that they believe the people that brought the law to the legislature were Christians, and therefore we have to have a separation of church and state. Believe it or not, the Supreme Court bought the argument, and the majority sided with the atheists. But the results of that case were monumental in the culture of the United States from that point on. Let me read to you the dissent from Justice Anton Scalia to let you understand what happened in this trial. He writes, The body of scientific evidence supporting creation science is as strong as that supporting evolution. In fact, it may be stronger. The evidence for evolution is far less compelling than we have been led to believe. Evolution is not a scientific fact, since it cannot actually be observed in a laboratory. Rather, evolution is merely a scientific theory or guess. He goes on to write, The scientific problems with evolution are so serious that it could accurately be termed a myth. Then he begins to talk about the actual impact of what the government of the United States had just done to its population. Listen to what he says. The censorship of creation science has at least two harmful effects. First, it deprives students of knowledge of one of the two scientific explanations for the origin of life and leads them to believe that evolution is a proven fact. Thus, their education suffers and they're wrongly taught that science has proven their religious beliefs false. And then he says, second, it violates the Establishment Clause. The United States Supreme Court has held that secular humanism is a religion, and so is atheism, for that matter. And so what has happened here is the government then has, according to the Justice Anton Scalia, has essentially picked a religion for the nation, and the religion is secularism, secular humanism and atheism. That should surprise many of us here. The second thing he says is this. Thus, by censoring creation science and instructing students that evolution is fact, public school teachers are now advancing religion in violation of the Establishment Clause. The government of the United States in 1987 chose the religion. They chose the origin story that all the nation would have to follow, everyone in the government, all the public schools, and so this is the way it was. Almost like a prophecy, this is what we have happen. You enter into the, er the decade of, of the 21st century, the first decade, and this is exactly what we find in our world. Every single place you go, evolution is immersed into all parts of our culture. In fact, it's so bad in the government that people like Ben Stein started making documentaries about it. And this one is called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. He talks about the gulag-like nature of working in the government or in the scientific world today or even in the universities if you doubt Darwin. Because in 1987, the government of the United States chose religions and they chose atheistic, secular humanist, evolutionist worldview story.
That became the religion of the United States. And since that time, friends, let me share with you that we are experiencing what happened in America to what happened in Europe. Many of you may recall that after World War II, what was Soviet, formerly the Christian world of, of Eastern Europe, when Russia came in and overtook all of that, communist, atheist Russia began changing things. Dr. Alistair McGrath talks about it in the book Twilight of Atheism. He writes, in July 1954, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union ordered an increased atheist commitment within the nation's schools. Alarmed at the persistence of religion, the party decreed that the teaching of school subjects should be saturated with atheism. They wanted a nation of atheists, and they knew that if they would teach atheism in the schools, they would get it. And of course, the number one tool was the worldview of evolution. The same thing is happening in America today and across all the world. Today in our culture, the government has hooks that are swimming in that culture, hooks that have no data or no bait on them because evolution really has no real data on them. They're simply snags that the government uses and the schools use and, and the culture itself uses to snag every one of its citizens into becoming a secular humanist or an atheist through the teaching of the theory of evolution. And so the goal of this series is to compare these two models. Let's be fair about it. Let's talk about the evolution model. Let's talk about the creation model. And we're going to ask you in this series which one makes the most sense. So today, in this first hook that we're going to talk about, is the hook that's swimming through the waters of our culture that says science is just about facts and religion is just about faith. You know, not too long ago, I was listening to one of these national public radio programs, and they had a scientist on the program, and he was taking questions. And one of the questions began to have a religious tone to it, and you could almost hear the scientist just puff up himself as he said, I'm a scientist. I only deal in facts. And you know, they would like you to believe that that's all scientists believe is facts, things that they can empirically see, things that they could test and, and re repeat. But you know, friends, let me share with you, is science really about facts or is religion really just about faith? I believe what they want to say is that I have all the facts and you just have your feelings. I don't know if that's a reasonable thing to say. Why don't we take a look at that for just a moment? Let's compare these two ideas. First, let's start with science. Now, I have a bachelor's degree in systems engineering, and I have a master's degree in electrical engineering. I've worked in, in applied sciences for like 15 years, so I can tell you that science certainly has facts in it. I learned a truckload of them, uh, things where the rubber meets the road. For example, uh, from scientists like these, from the dawn of modern science, like Sir Francis Bacon. You know, I mention him because he lived at a time when the knowledge that we called science was forced upon by human philosophy. And he was a man that said, no, no, we want to see the facts. Let us do experiments. Let us draw our knowledge of science from observation and experimentation. Unfortunately, today, we've gone exactly the opposite, where we force our knowledge of science based upon a philosophy of evolution. Isn't that interesting? Or how about this man, Jonas Kepler, who is called the father of celestial mechanics. This was the man who says he believes that he was thinking God's thoughts after him. Or perhaps Robert Boyle, who was the father of modern chemistry as opposed to the alchemy of his day. I remember uh, studying his famous Boyle's Law that relates pressure and temperature and volume when I was going to school. Or perhaps this man, Sir Isaac Newton, that really changed our world with physics and his understanding of uh, mathematics as he gave us the idea of gravity and the laws of motion. I was said that Sir Isaac Newton wrote more about theology than he did about science. And another man that actually has changed our world today, there would not be lights here today without the discoveries of Michael Faraday who was in the very era when Darwin was living. And Michael Faraday, even in the midst of all that uh, secularism that was coming about because of Darwin, was a humble Christian man. Or take Louis Pasteur, also of the time of Darwin, who was thought to be the greatest biologist of all time. He was a man who discovered germ theory. He was one who saved many lives by making vaccines. He discovered pasteurization. 
And, all, and I'll tell you, this man believed that Darwin's theories were telling us the wrong way to see life. And he was an ardent anti-Darwinist. Come into the 20th century, we have Werner von Braun, a man who was also a man of faith, who took us to the moon. Or we could talk about Raymond Damien, who was the inventor of the MRI, a very famous scientist. But when you come to the era of the 1990s, things began to change in science and in our world. Uh, take, for example, Richard Lumsden, who was a professor of parasitology and a director of a department for many years in a college, who was forced out by the faculty when he had a conversion to Christianity, and he began to believe in creation. And you know what's sad, friends, that all of these men and many other ones that were the founders of modern science, the ones who basically were the, the foundation of what we have today as technology is based upon their discoveries, if they were living today, they would not be allowed to teach in the university because many of them were ardent anti-Darwinists and all of them were theists. It's amazing, friends, what has happened in our world because of the events in 1987. And so science, yes, science can be about facts. But let me ask you, what about religion, and specifically the religion of Christianity? Now I can tell you that my faith as a Christian is based in the atoning work and the saving work of Jesus Christ for me. But that faith is not resting on thin air. It rests upon the foundation of the scriptures. And let me tell you that the scriptures, the Bible, is probably one of the most scientifically discovered and explored books on the planet. I cannot think of another religion that has their sacred book that has had so much scientific inquiry as the Bible has. And let me show you that science actually can factualize the Bible. Uh, one of the ways it can do that is through the science of archaeology. What you see here is the Beersheba, which is the place that Abraham dwelt. And if you think about the Bible, the Bible takes place in the Fertile Crescent that runs from Egypt all the way over to uh, Iraq and Iran and through Turkey. And in this ancient world, this is where we can find some of the most ancient languages and some of the most ancient locations on the planet. And the Bible was there for thousands of years with a narrative of the people that lived in those places, talking about the very places themselves. The Bible was there, but now science can come along later and factualize the Bible. And here's how it can happen. Look at the archaeological encyclopedia of the Holy Land. They say, beginning with the pioneering 1838 researchers, the landscape of the land of the Bible slowly emerged from the realm of idealized tradition to be explored thoroughly, mapped accurately, and described in modern archaeological terms. In other words, what they're saying is, that the science of archaeology is really a rather recent thing, only 200 years old maybe. And so what that tells me is the Bible has been there for thousands of years, and science only came along later and says that's a fact. Let's take a look at how science can show you the Bible is factual. Here's five ways right here. The Bible can show is factual through historic places in the ancient world, historic people in the ancient world, historic events, the historical culture of the ancient world, and finally the material culture. In all of those ways, the science of archaeology shows the Bible was there first, and then of course science came along later and said, that's a fact. Let's start with historic places. Take for example, Eric or Kala. Both of these are found in the table of nations that we find in Genesis chapter 10. Places that were developed by a man named Nimrod. Or take Nineveh or Ur. Ur is an interesting one. Ur is the place where Abraham was born. It was there that Sir Charles Woolley also discovered the first evidence of the flood from archaeology. We have Babylon, Tyre, Sidon, Elkron. Even Ophir, a place where we haven't found but we know exists because of archaeology. For example, in Tel Kassil in Jaffa, they found an inscription on a pottery that says, mentions the gold of Ophir and how uh, unique and pure it was. Now, let's go into uh, Israel or Palestine. Today, if you look on a map in the back of any Bible, you will find many different names from Beersheba all the way down to Capernaum. And all of these names, all of these places have been discovered by archaeology. And of course, the Bible was there first, and then science came along later and said, that is a fact. 
I like the one Nob here because the, the city of Nob is only found in the Bible because it is a place that was created for the priest. It was one of the priestly cities. And of course, it was found in archaeology as well. Now let's take a look at historical people and events. And it's in this area where archaeology really is a little bit limited. For example, unless something was carved into stone or pressed into some type of material or scratched onto a pottery shard or painted on, then it probably wasn't discovered. And the reason for that is found in a book that's called What Did the Bible Writers Know and When Did They Know It? by William G. Devers. And what he describes is that in Israel they have found caches of places where they have found these little bullets, these little seal impressions, where ancient events would have been written on papyrus, but unfortunately that papyrus has deteriorated and what we're left is with these seal impressions. But from what, even with that limitation, there have been many amazing finds in archaeology. Take, for example, this find. It was a little silver amulet. And this little amulet was found in a tomb in Jerusalem that was dated all the way back to the Davidic dynasty. Can you imagine this lady who was in this tomb? She was living when David was living. She falls asleep and her family places her sacred text that she had loved all her life in with her. A text that was from Numbers chapter 6 verse 24 to 26. It says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and give you peace. Oh, isn't that amazing? That is one of the most ancient texts of the Bible that's found in archaeology. And in it we find the Tetragrammaton, the very holy name of God that's in Exodus, that begins in Exodus. Or take this bullet, a seal impression of Baruch, the very scribe of Jeremiah. According to Keith Chauville, Professor Emeritus of Hebrew and Semitic Studies at Wisconsin-Madison, he writes about this. He says, the script that's used is pre-exilic ancient Hebrew linear script that they find on the bullet, rather than the post-exilic script adopted by the Jews from the contemporary Aramaic script. This bullet was no doubt from the impression of Barak bin Narai, who wrote the dictation to the prophet Jeremiah. This is an amazing discovery. And of course, the Bible was there first. Science came along later and said, that is a fact. Or take the Tel Dan Stella, which was found in Dan in the northern part of Israel. It's written in Aramaic. It's dated all the way back to 900 years before uh, Christ. And it says right on there, the house of David, which means the dynasty of David. Again, another amazing find. And there have been many seal impressions that have been found. This is just a small sampling of them that say, for example, uh, servants of the king, Goliath the son of Pashur, or Ahab the king of Israel, belonging to Ahaz the son of Jotham, king of Judah, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Isaiah, king of Judah. These are amazing things. These are all finds of kings that we find in the Bible. But probably one of the most interesting ones is comes from outside of the biblical lands. And that is one of the interesting ones is the prism of Sennacherib, who was an Assyrian king. And on this prism, it talks about how this Assyrian king had come into Judah, had destroyed a city, Lashik, and had come over to Jerusalem, had abstracted some tribute from Hezekiah, but then came back with his troops and surrounded the city. But uh, from there, it doesn't say much after that. We can pick up the rest of the story in 2 Kings 19 where we learn that God sent an angel to destroy his army and send him home with his tail running. Interestingly, in 2 Kings chapter 19, it talks about what happened to him when he got back, how he died, the way he died, who killed him, and who succeeded him. And all of these facts have been found in Assyrian annals. And of course, the Bible was there for thousands of years. The Bible was there first, and then science came along later and said, that is a fact. It's an amazing thing. Or how about the Karnak Temple in Egypt, where some, some 900 years before Christ, this king entered into uh, Israel and attacked them. It's found in 1 Kings 14.25, the exact same story. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Pharaoh Shishak, king of Egypt, attack Jerusalem. Once again, they match one for one. Or the Merimta Stella, which names Israel. It's from the period of the judges. It's one of the oldest uh, exact things. It talks about the name of Israel. 
When we get into the New Testament, there are many more discoveries. For example, this one at Caesarea Maritima that was dated to AD 30 that reads, Tiberium Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. This is the Pilate that had Jesus crucified. Or perhaps the ossuary of Caiaphas, which was a secondary burial tomb that has the name of the Caiaphas who was judging Jesus on that day. And there can be many more, friends. You can discover them. There's so many out there. But let's talk about how science factualizes the Bible through the culture that of that day or the material culture that was in the day it was written. You know, many people don't realize that the Bible is, are historical narratives that were written by people that lived when these things happened and not at another period. And the way science factualizes that is through the discoveries that they've made with the Newsy tablets. The Newsy tablets were found over in Iraq and Iran area. And these tablets have some of the most ancient languages on them and ancient civilizations dated to the time of Abraham. And interestingly, they talked about when they were discovering what they said on them, they were talking about just daily life. And one of the things that happened in the daily life of the people back in those days was that when somebody got married, the father would typically give a handmaiden as a gift. And this is exactly what we find in the Bible in Genesis chapter 29, verses 28 to 29, where it says, And he gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. Laban also gave his maid Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her maid. In fact, this is so amazing that scholars have even re responded about it. In the Anchor Bible Dictionary, Dr. Ephraim Spicer writes this, if our author had copied the two verses from an original contract from Iran, he could not have come any closer to the cuneiform parallel. And again, friends, the Bible was there first, and then science came along later and said that's a fact. Or take Dr. William Devers as he talks about the city gates that we find in the Bible. He writes, the many biblical passages that mention city gates fit remarkably well with the excavated gates at a number of sites in the 10th to 7th centuries, and only of this period. In the Persian Hellenistic Roman period, such gates had long since passed out of existence and memory, as archaeological evidence has shown. No writer living then could have invented city gates like ours, known only long before the Iron Age. And so what we see is that the Bible was there first and science came along later and said that's a fact. And you know, friends, this should give you faith because as you are reading that scripture, you're reading real history, scientifically factualized history. Now, do we have all of it? No. But how many points do you need to draw the straight line to conclusion? <laughs> the Bible was there first. Science came along later and said that's a fact. Well, so we looked at science. Yes, science can be about facts. We looked at religion, specifically Christianity, the Bible. It is a religion of faith, but it is also based upon facts, historical facts proven by science. But now, what about science itself? Is science just about facts when it talks about the origins of life on this planet? Let's take a look at that for just a moment. You know, many people don't realize that the theory of evolution is a theory that sits on its head. It, this is the foundation of it. It looks like an inverted pyramid where the foundation, billions and billions and billions of years ago, they say that lifeless chemicals miraculously self-organized themselves into what I consider to be the most miraculous thing imaginable, a living, self-replicating organism that can reproduce itself. But this is the story that they've given us. And then from that uh, magical first coming of that organism, then it replicated itself and many times and in over billions of years. It morphed itself from every single thing that you see on the planet, <laughs> from the plants that you're looking at to the insects that you're seeing. All of it was morphed from this single cell. That's the basic Genesis story of evolution. And what they call that is spontaneous generation. And of course, that means life coming from non-life. So in other words, non-living things can spawn living, complicated, complex organisms. That's kind of the belief. Let's talk about where this belief really started originating in history. Uh, Dr. Ariel Roth talks about this in Science Discovers God, where he says that the pioneer chemist Jean-Baptiste von Helmont provided a formula for making mice. If you would hide dirty rags with grain and cheese in the attic, you would soon find mice there. 
Hey, you know, we would laugh about that today. But, you know, back in those days, in the 17th century, there were people who saw uh, basically tadpoles coming up out of the mud in the springtime, or they would see uh, apple that has a worm in it. Or perhaps the most familiar thing that they would see without refrigeration would be meat that would have maggots in it. And they would think, well, there, see, there's life from non-life. And in those days, if you didn't believe this, you were not considered scientific because you didn't believe it. And so they were thinking that non-living things could grow living things. And it just because they saw it in their daily life. But interestingly, at the same time, there was a scientist minded man named Francisco Reddy who thought, well, maybe I will try an experiment to see if this is really true. And he took some meat and put it in jars that were covered and more jars that were open. And sure enough, the ones that were covered did not spawn these maggots, but the ones that were open, they did. And he said, hmm, I think the reason this is happening is because of flies. And that sort of falsified this idea of life coming from non-life. But you know, it really wasn't about that. They kept thinking that it was possible. And by the time we get to the era of Darwin, they were actually brewing primordial soups. They were uh, taking organic material and they were placing it in jars that were covered and jars that were open. And they, if they left it long enough, they began seeing things growing in it. And of course, all of us have done the same experiment at home when we've taken a Tupperware full of food and we stick it in the refrigerator and forget about it and we notice that things are growing in it. This is what they were seeing. And it was at this time that Darwin's theory was beginning to become popular, that Darwin himself looked at spontaneous generation and said, that's how it happened, that's how we got there. And he's the one that started talking about this little soup uh, somewhere, of primordial soup, where out of, the, out of it came the first life. Well, fortunately, there was a scientist that was living in that day. His name was Louis Pasteur. We just talked about him. And Louis Pasteur used the science of pasteurization to falsify their primordial soups. He would just basically take their soups, pasteurize them, which is heat them up enough to kill the microbes in them. And then he would cover them up or leave them open. And guess what? There wasn't anything growing in them. And that falsified the theory. But of course, it never was about science, I think. It was about philosophy at this point. So as we move forward from this time, the idea of spontaneous generation got a new name. It was called abiogenesis. And of course, that was in the 1870s, where they were talking about, well, maybe chemicals can form themselves automatically together. They began believing this because scientists were beginning to discover how to create chemicals that we find in our bodies, like, for example, urea. But by the time we get to the 1920s, things were changing. The, in Russia, during this period, there was a man named Alexander Orphan, and he was a man living in communist Marxist Russia at this time. Listen to how he sees the theory of evolution in his day. He writes in Signature of the Cell, Stephen Meyer writes about this, saying, common teaching described Darwinian evolution and revolutionary political thought as being so intimately connected that they amounted to the same thing. In this view, Darwinism was materialistic. It called for change in all spheres. It was atheistic. It was politically radical. And it was causing a transformation of thoughts and politics. And Orpen had an idea. He had a new theory. He called it evolutionary abiogenesis. He envisioned a multi-billion year process of transforming simple chemicals into complex monobelic systems. And that, of course, became known as chemical evolution. And here's his idea. He basically imagined a chemistry experiment. He said, well, what do I need to have to come together to maybe form a simple amino acid, which are found in living things? Their proteins are made of amino acids. And so he imagined a world, an earth, if you will, a primordial earth filled with methane and ammonia and various excitable hydrocarbons, but no oxygen in his old world. Listen to what uh, Dr. Meyer says. By 1936, Oprin had come to think that the early Earth's atmosphere was devoid of free oxygen. Instead, he envisioned an early Earth atmosphere containing a noxious mixture of energy-rich Gases such as ammonia, dicarbons, hydrogen, steam, and simple hydrocarbons. And so what he basically was doing was saying, what kind of things would I have to make in a chemistry experiment in order for me to make an amino acid to form like we did urea, you know, which was another product that our bodies make. 
And by the time we get to the 1950s in the University of Chicago, some scientists said, let's see if we can actually make Oprin's idea happen. And the man's name was Stanley Miller and Harold Urey. And what they did was they formed an experiment. It was a closed loop experiment where they put these gases into the, into the mix and they excluded oxygen from the whole system. They then sparked it off to, to make the chemical reaction happen and then they protected the things that they would get from the spark in this little trap at the bottom. And they actually were able to form some amino acids. Well, you should have heard the groundswell. Matter of fact, if you were then, if you were living then, you probably heard the earth shake and the sound of dum, 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 da dum, bum, 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 bum. You know, the whole world changed as the evolutionist worldview was lifted up in the press and, and put in the chemistry books. Oh, this is the origin of life. The ancient earth must have been a world of a methane and ammonia and this is must have been how it happened chemical evolution is true evolution is true you know they were celebrating in the streets and for many years this went on until we get to the decade of the 1980s but in the decade of the 1980s new discoveries were making that sound very non-scientific for example, in the 1980s, we discovered our planet had always had oxygen in the atmosphere. I was like, hello. It's almost like science finally caught up with reality. I and mean, our oxygen is primarily nitrogen and oxygen. Huh, hello. They found oxidized iron bands in the oldest rocks in the volcanic material. They found oxygen on Mars and Venus. And suddenly they began saying, you know, <clears> it <throat> doesn't look like the ancient Earth had anything other than oxygen in the atmosphere. And of course, what's the big deal about oxygen in the first place? Well, uh, Dr. Myers writes about this, about a book called The Mystery of o Life's Origin. And he says, even a small amount of atmospheric oxygen will quench the production of biologically significant building blocks and cause biomolecules otherwise present to degrade rapidly because oxygen is very reactive. And so what this means is that, that even if these things happened, it could never have happened on this planet because oxygen has always been present in the atmosphere. So the bottom line is, by the time we get to the 1980s, it was very clear that spontaneous generation, life of non-life, has never, ever, ever occurred. And this began to be seen in the scientific world itself. Take the May 13th, 1982 edition of the New Scientist magazine. He said, this picture captured the popular imagination and the story of life emerging in the seas or of pools of a planet swathed in an atmosphere of methane and ammonia soon became part of the scientific folklore that every school child knows. And I think that's very sad that every school child would have to know that. But now this particular card house seems to have been demolished. <laughs> it was beginning to be recognized that all of this was bad science. Dr. Stephen Myers writes again, he says, two leading geochemists, James Brooks and Gordon Shaw, argued that if an ocean rich in amino and nucleic acids had existed, it would have left large deposits of nitrogen-rich materials. No evidence of such deposits exist. From this, we can be reasonably certain that there never was any substantial amount of primitive soup on the Earth. So even the building block chemicals are not found on this planet. And this is what they were telling us then. And you know, it's even worse than that. You know, in Darwin's day, when he was looking at simple uh, single cell animals, like this E. coli bacteria, to him it probably had the appearance of, a, of the simplicity of a child's toy wagon. And so he might think in his mind that he could do that. But by the time we get to the 1980s, everything changed with the discovery of DNA. And the fact that not only do we know what DNA is, but we now learn at this time that DNA actually has instructions in it. That DNA is not randomly coded, but rather it is intentionally coded, and that instructions on DNA are read by complex machines, and those complex machines then build proteins that build you. Once that was discovered, that changed everything in the equation. Science began to change itself. Just think about Francis Crick, one of the originators of discovery of DNA. He writes, what is so frustrating 
for our present purpose is that it seems almost impossible to give any numerical value to the probability of what seems a rather unlikely sequence of events. An honest man armed with all the knowledge available to us now could only state that in some sense the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle. In other words, it could never have happened by accident. It could never have happened by chance. It had to have another meaning. And he says it's a miracle. And other scientists began to say the same thing. For example, a scientist, Bernard Olaf Kuppers, who wrote Information and the Origin of Life. He says, even if all the matter in space consisted of DNA molecules of the structural complexity of the bacterial genome with random sequences, then the chances of finding among them a bacterial genome or something resembling one would still be negligible. And what he's saying is, if we can convert all the matter in space to the DNA sequence of a bacterial genome, which would be about um, of several million lines of code, and just randomly sequence them. If we look through all the matter in space that way, we'd never find one that was just like a real bacterial genome. It's just that impossible. Life is just that amazing. An atheist, a former atheist, Sir Fred Hoyle, who was, was a scientist, became coming out in Nature magazine November 12, 1981, and said, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged this way, you know, this spontaneous generation, is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a seven, Boeing 747 from the materials therein. And this was sort of the tenure of the people back in the 1980s. He and another man named Chandra Wishmonsky wrote a book, Evolution from Space, where they said this. Once we see, however, that the probability of life originating at random is so utterly minuscule as to make it absurd, it becomes sensible to think that the favorable properties of physics on which life depends are in every respect deliberate. It is therefore almost inevitable that our own measure of intelligence must reflect higher intelligences even to the limit of God. All of this happening in the 1980s. And as we, as we leave the decade of the 1980s, scientists that were looking back on it, even historians were looking back on it. A book came out on the market called Doubts About Darwin, A History of Intelligent Design, written by Thomas Woodward. He was not a scientist, he was getting his PhD, and this was his dissertation, talking about what was happening in science, and talking about the rise of a new movement, a movement of intelligent design. Scientists coming out and saying, whoa, this spontaneous generation thing didn't happen, something else must be at foot. And he starts talking about scientists like Michael Denton, who wrote the book, Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, where he says this, one might have expected that a theory of such cardinal importance, a theory that literally changed the world, would have been something more than metaphysics, something more than myth. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Or how, how about this scientist, uh, Dr. Michael J. Behu, came out in the 1990s, who wrote the book, The Darwin's Black Box, The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution. In it, he says this, Publish or perish is a proverb that academics take seriously. If you do not publish your work for the rest of the community to evaluate, then you have no business in academia. And if you don't already have tenure, you will be banished. But the same can be applied to theories as well. If a theory claims to be able to explain some phenomenon but does not generate even an attempt at an explanation, then it should be banished. He goes on to say this, despite comparing sequences and mathematical modeling, molecular evolution has never addressed the question of how complex structures came to be. In effect, the theory of Darwinian molecular evolution has not published, and so it should perish. Isn't that a powerful thought? It should perish. But of course, well, even in this time, another scientist, mathematicians started getting into the game, like Dr. William Dubensky and Jonathan Witt, writing the book Intelligent Design. Or even lawyers, a Berkeley professor named Philip E. Johnson started writing books about this situation that was happening in our world. Uh, in Doubts About Darwin, they write that in all six books, Johnson argues that every area of relevant scientific evidence tends to falsify Darwinism rather than confirm it. How about this man, 
The Icons of Evolution by Jonathan Wells. Here's a book that frightened more evolutionists than any others because he took the most popular visual proofs that are put into textbooks for the indoctrination of our children and he put them to withering criticism. For example, Doubts About Darwin says, Wells selects the 10 most popular visual proofs of evolution that are found in virtually every textbook used in high school biology classes. He exposes each of them to withering criticism, pointing out significant omissions and inaccuracies, some of which border on fraud. Scientists began coming out, one right after the other. And in the 21st century, we have uh, Stephen Meyer, who has his PhD in the philosophy of science, where he writes the book Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. In it, uh, Dr. Philip Eskell, writing about it, says, in this engaging narrative, Meyer demonstrates what I, as a chemist, have long suspected. Undirected chemical processes cannot produce the exquisite complexity of the living cell. He also shows compelling positive evidence for intelligent design in the digital code stored in the cell's DNA. A decisive case based upon breathtaking and cutting edge science. And so friends, it's only been getting more and more like this. Dr. Stephen Myers writes, research efforts to date had led to a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on earth rather than its solution. At present, all discussions on principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or a confession of ignorance. And so friends, let me go back to where we started. The theory of evolution is a theory that sits on its head. The very foundation of evolution is this point billions of years ago when they claim lifeless chemicals by accident self-organize themselves obviously into the most miraculous thing you can ever imagine, a living self-replicating cell with millions of lines of DNA, information within it. Now that's a, that's a miracle, isn't it? And friends, guess what? Science here today says it never happened. And imagine, if the origin story never happened, then did the rest of it ever happen? <laughs> Let's find out. You know, I'd like to uh, ask this. Is science just about facts when it talks about origins? Or is science also about faith? Are scientists today, as they are indoctrinating others, or school teachers, as they are indoctrinating people into the Darwinian worldview of evolution, are they saying that because they have empirical facts, that they can back it up, that it's observable in, the, in, in nature itself or in the fossil record? Or are they saying it because they simply want to believe it? In other words, are they saying it because they have faith that it happened? You know, let's ask this question to probably one of the, the greatest uh, atheists and uh, person who stands upon science, the bully pulpit of science, to put down Christianity, and that's the man, uh, Sir Richard Dawkins. You know, if I was to describe him, I would say that he's the Billy Graham of the religion of atheism as he goes around the country putting people down who are Christians talking about how he is science and how they are dumb for believing in Christianity or for creation. Well, in this uh, series that I talked about, Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed, Ben Stein actually got this man on camera. And after allowing him to go through his book, The God Delusion, and put down Christianity and basically make everyone who is a Christian feel horrible, he then asks him these questions. He says, talking about origins now, he says, well, tell me, how did it start? And uh, Richard Dawkins answers him, and he says, nobody knows how it got started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that must have happened for the origin of life. And then Ben Stein asks the obvious question. He says, what was that? And then Richard Dawkins says, well, it was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Okay. There we have it. He's talking about the origin story of evolution. This place in time, billions of years ago, from the primordial soup that this magical event happened, when, this miraculous event, when life came from non-life. All right? Spontaneous generation. And so uh, then Ben Stein asked the obvious question. Right. And how did that happen? Okay, friends. Here's the moment of truth. I mean, here's the Billy Graham of atheism who sits on the bully pulpit of science. 
I am sure that if this man has any evidence, he's going to lay it on him right now. He's going to say, here, you got room? They're going to back a truck up right here. We're just going to dump all these evidence on you. Here's fact number one, Ben. Here's fact number two. By the way, I've got all this empirical evidence. And here in the fossil record, I've got it all. And there it is. Don't you expect him to do that? I mean, after all, science can't possibly be about faith, is it, when it comes to origins? Let's find out. Richard Dawkins, I've told you, we don't know. We don't know? We don't know? Friends, what is going on in America today? Have you swallowed that hook? When they tell you that science is just about facts, when it comes to the origin of life on this planet, don't believe them. Science is very much about faith. In fact, scientists themselves know that. I'll give the last word to a researcher named Dean L. Overman who writes in the book, A Case Against Accident and Self-Organization, when he says this, one may choose on a religious basis to believe in self-organization theories, but such a belief must be based on one's metaphysical assumptions, not on science and mathematical probabilities. <laughs> Friends, I pray that you have not swallowed that hook when they tell you that science is just about facts and religion is just about faith when it comes to the origin of life on this planet. All right, friends. Well, next time when we explore what science, well, have you swallowed the hook? 21st century challenge to the 19th century worldview. We'll be looking at the hook when they tell you only evolution fits the data. Wait till then. We'll find out why. Well, listen, let's close with the word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for science. Truly, you have given us this gift on this planet. And I thank you so much for scientists who are willing to come forward and talk about origins and show us that this origin story of evolution never happened on this planet. Thank you so much for the Bible and the science that shows us how factual it is and that it really represents the history of the world that we're living in. And it talks about our salvation, a salvation that we can have in Jesus. I thank you for all of that in his name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, and goodbye.